Dr. Molly Lawler is the lead author and serves as the principal scientific advisor for Mind Up, an evidence-based social emotional learning program grounded in neuroscience. She's an expert in child and adolescent social and emotional development. Her research includes the investigation of mindfulness and psychological adjustment in children and adolescents, and evaluations of social emotional learning programs for children and adolescents in school settings. Dido Bala is a passionate educator and entrepreneur and is the head of education for MindUp. He is also the founder of a nonprofit organization called FitLit, whose mission is to use a blended curriculum of fitness and literature to empower youth. As an experienced brain trainer, Dido has positively impacted hundreds of parents and educators, as well as thousands of students in the areas of emotional intelligence, mindful awareness, and positive psychology. I'd like to warmly welcome Dido and Molly today. Thanks so much, Leo. Happy to be here. Great. Well, we start off with a backstory when we do our International Curriculum Specialist Series, and we'd like to know where you've come from. So where, you, where your wisdom and your expertise has come from. So could you tell me how you started on your journey to study and eventually work with MindUp in social and emotional learning and mindfulness? Molly, can we start with you? Sure, happy to. Um, so my, my background has really been in the field of psychology um, for, for as long as I can remember. I've been interested in um, the human condition and, and our, our own experience throughout our lifetimes, really developmentally. Um, and over the course of my studies, I, I you know, started in psychology, uh, did some graduate work in counseling psychology, worked in a therapeutic capacity, and then became really interested in primary prevention and thinking about using strengths-based approaches to give um, primarily children and adolescents the skills early on in life so that that would mitigate um, issues later on regarding mental health that I was seeing in, in working with um older university aged uh, students. So that's really the trajectory of my interests. And over time, I, I, I began to bec become more interested in the field of social <clears throat> and emotional learning, excuse me, and mindfulness in particular. And along my graduate path, um, while I was uh, working in my master's degree and, and PhD, subsequent PhD, um, I met uh, Goldie Hawn who was interested at the time uh, to start a program to promote joy and resilience for children. Um, this was following the uh, September 11th attacks in New York City. Uh, Goldie at that time was very affected personally in, in understanding what, what was happening with children, um, not just in the U.S., but globally. Um, so I, I met Goldie and, and, and the story begins uh, around Mind Up and its development. And so I've been along the path of Mind Up for nearly 20 years, um, both on, on really researching the program in schools, understanding its effectiveness, but also on the program development side and working with um, experts in the field of various areas of science, including neuroscience and positive psychology, as well as educators to develop the program to what you we have today um, as an easy to use evidence-based program. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Great, what about you, Dito? Thanks, Lee. So I'm I'm mostly an educator. I, I came to mind up as an educator because as somebody who has always wondered, how, what can I do as one single individual in a classroom in front of 20 students, 25, 30, 40 students, what can I do to create the best learning environment for them? It became evident to me very early in my career teaching that it was not enough to teach the content that was prescribed, whether it be English, math, science, or any other subject. I realized early on that something about the disposition of the kids as it, it pertains to their feelings, um, the, the safety that they, they, they feel, their comfort level, how happy they are in the classroom, all those things had an impact in their learning. And so I investigated and started exper uh, having experiments in my classrooms with practices, which at the time I didn't know were mindfulness. And it is after I studied my master's of education um, that I learned about uh, brain targeted teaching and the very fact that the things that were intuitive to me, the practices that were intuitive to me in the classroom actually had a scientific foundation. And if you understood the brain better, you could be a better teacher. And that's how I started my journey. And then I just, at that point, a friend of mine worked for, uh, it was the Hon Foundation back then. 
and introduced me to uh, the former director of uh, training and partnerships who interviewed me and I got the job as a trainer. And really my journey with MindUp began as a teacher who was using the MindUp principles to teach my own students. And then a teacher who spent a lot of hours thinking about how to help other teachers do the same. So I traveled around the country uh, training teachers um, helping them understand that mind up is not just a, a curriculum or a program; it's a way of life uh, that you can easily implement. And since from then to now, I've had several roles with the organization, um, and I'm, I'm happy to be here and dig a little deeper. That's great. So you mentioned about a little bit of the start, of how mind up started with Goldie Hawn. Can you tell me a bit more about the backstory and uh, wh where it is now? Uh, sure, I can. I can begin. So, um, really, Mind Up uh, began as a passion project, um, but from the outset, Goldie was adamant that it needed to be grounded in science, as far as you know, its development being research based and really drawing from the latest science in in four fields, being neuroscience, positive psychology, social and emotional learning, and and mindfulness. And in addition to that, not just grounded in the science, but actually be evaluated. You know, does this program work in the way that we expect it to? And is it safe is the other important question. And so that was really um, part and parcel in the development was working with um, our, our lead uh, scientific advisor on our scientific advisory board, Dr. Kim Schoenert Reichel at the University of British Columbia, which is where I was as well, um, designing evaluation studies from the get-go. So we started our first pilot and evaluation in 2005. And from there, every step of the way, we've integrated, you know, what did we learn from these research studies into the design of the program? So over the years, it's had several iterations, um, which is important in program design and development so that you get it right and you're listening to the feedback from your users. So we've had a lot of different iterations and we've We've recently just launched our latest second edition, official, uh, online, which is which is brought together all of that, um, also updating all of the science. There's been a lot that's happened in the last decade in all four of our pillars of scientific research, but also the feedback from students and, and educators as to what they want to see in the curriculum. Dito, I'm not sure if you have uh, more to add there, probably. <laughs> yeah, I will, take it, I will take it from there and say that. So the second edition that, that Molly is talking about is the current one that we're using. And a few things uh, happened with that. It happens to be that it's during COVID that we uh, finalized and launched it, which means that now with a curriculum and content platform that was digital and online, we were able to have access, to give access to this content to folks from all around the world. And at a time when there was so much uncertainty, such, uh, so uh, such a high level of uncertainty, um, educators and parents have certainly welcomed the the, 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 the the chance to use a platform that's virtual. And we went from having 15 lessons to, to 17 because uh, the importance of starting with building community in the classroom is something that we did not want to leave to, to, to chance. So we know that most um, educators start with building community um, However, we wanted to make it explicit that before you teach the first mind up lesson, take the time to create a safe environment for you and for your students, uh, come up with some agreements that are going to uh, inform how you, 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 the culture in your classroom. And then at the end of it too, at the end of mind up, we wanted it to, to be clear that it is a system that goes from, from the individual into the community. So we added taking mindful action into, into the community. So that's when it comes to the curriculum. And the training has also evolved because when COVID started, obviously we couldn't travel to schools anymore. And before COVID, we used to travel to schools and train teachers. And that's how I joined MindUp around 2015. That's what I was doing. But obviously with COVID, we couldn't do it. So we, we moved our trainings virtually as well. So over the past few years, we have given access to so many folks from around the world and have delivered virtual tra virtual trainings pretty much everywhere um, as well. So a silver lining as we come out of COVID, you can see an expansion of uh, a program or mind up such as yours that has now gone to more countries or even kind of reaching more people and have more accessibility. So, so maybe not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So with your work at research, 
um, what exactly is social emotional learning, or sometimes called SEL, and what should SEL look and feel like in the classroom? Molly, could you answer that? I can definitely answer that. Um, but I just want to go back to your last question because I wanted to mention one more thing, which I oh, didn't. Yeah. Um, as part of our second edition, we also have taken a, a, a real approach at addressing the developmental needs across uh, childhood and adolescence. So we have a new early years or uh, pre-K uh, program oh. that specifically is designed for early years childhood settings and that age group of uh, children typically around age three to five. And then we also um, redesigned our middle school or grade six to eight, you know, uh, I'd say age 12 to 14 year olds uh, curriculum, um, specifically with that early adolescent brain in mind. So uh, we've included more about the adolescent brain, uh, student facing, so they learn about what's going on in that brain of theirs. And also um, more pieces around um, uh, Dito mentioned the community aspect and also thinking about interconnectedness, uh, mindful consumption, and also self-compassion and self-care. So those are ways that we're we're meeting the needs of our uh, developmental context a little bit more specifically. So I'll, that was my last little bit there on the, on the mind up journey and development. And now I can turn to the question on SCL if you like. Great. Yeah. And it sounds like those those are great upgrades. I mean, when you're talking about mindful consumption or mindless consumption, and going even to the uh, you know to the early years, I mean, these are really important areas that you've expanded in. So it sounds like you've grown incredibly in in your journey with Mind Up. So it's great to hear. With that in mind, yeah, what is SEL? What how would you define it? And what does it yeah, feel so and look like in a classroom? Sure. So social and emotional learning is really the skills, attitudes, and behaviors that children, adolescents, and adults <laughs> need to be successful in life. And so those skills include things like self-awareness, being aware of your, um, your strengths and limitations, having a growth mindset, being aware of your emotional state, um, self-management, which is being able to regulate those emotions, being able to manage yourself to achieve your goals, Social awareness, which is having perspective taking and empathy for others, relationship skills, being able to form and maintain healthy relationships, resolve conflicts peacefully, work in teams and groups, and then responsible decision making, which is being able to make um, uh, decisions with an awareness and caring of others and what the impacts will be uh, of, of each of your decisions. So that's the framework that's been put out by the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning, which is CASEL, CASEL.org for anyone who wants to learn more about them. And really, SEL stems from a lot of the work done by um, Dr. Dan Goldman, who coined the term emotional intelligence, a book that came out over 20 years ago. Um, and it's, it's really, we've learned over the past 30 years how integral SEL is to our success in life, not just in school, but in relationships and work and all of these things. So as far as what does it look like, sound like, feel like in the classroom, it's really, you know, it's not, it used to be seen as like one more thing on the plate. It's, it's the plate, you know, it's the thing that holds us all up. Uh, when we think about our changing global economy and, and, and what students are going to be going out into the world, it's, we really need to be able to collaborate with others. We need to be able to work in teams. We need to be able to think creatively, be flexible. All of these skills are really grounded in social and emotional learning. So in classrooms, if we're thinking about how do we create these, these opportunities for kids to both learn these skills because they're learned, they're malleable, you can get better at them, but also have opportunities for practice. So you want to have a program, an evidence-based program like MindUp, that's going to teach the skills, but then you want to create an environment, and, and Dito can speak to this certainly, um, that provide the opportunities for practice. So giving kids opportunities to collaborate with one another, uh, work in teams, um, have autonomy and choice in, in their learning so that they have more ownership and develop that sort of sense of self-awareness and what are my strengths and limitations and how do I work with that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit about what it looks like. And then at the front of the room or, you know, around the room circulating <laughs> is the teacher. 
and they need to be modeling these skills as well. And so that's another critical piece. So I'm going to stop there because I want to also um, hear from Dito on, on the practical side of what it looks like. Thank, thank. I do love what you said, that SCL is not another thing on the plate, but the plate. That's really nicely said. Yes, Dito, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. It, it's, a, it's a good transition because it goes into this, this idea of a lifestyle. It is not enough to take a program that is research and just, quote unquote, teach it. Teach it needs to mean that you understand it. You see the benefits in your own life because those skill sets are beneficial for children and adults, like Molly said, and then model them. So once you have that, then you start with thinking about a, a program like MindUp, for example. When we start with building safe communities, in order for your students to feel comfortable exploring who they are and having that awareness, they need to feel safe. So it looks like taking the time in the beginning of the school year to outline what does it mean to feel safe in this classroom? What are some agreements that make sense to us? How are we going to ask questions? How are we going to respond when we don't, we don't, we don't feel comfortable? Who do we talk to? How do we raise our hands? It's all those very practical skills that you can teach to create a safe environment. And then with a program like Mind Up, you go into teaching about the brain. And the more students learn about their own brains, the more they have that awareness, which then leads to the regulation. Because if you understand where your feelings come from, if you understand what leads to you perceiving perhaps something as simple as having a bad grade as a very strong danger, which leads you to have a strong emotional reaction. If you understand that, number one, you realize that there's nothing wrong with you because that's just how the brain works. And then once you have that awareness, you can work on mindful awareness practices such as mindful breathing and mindful listening through a brain break to regulate those emotions. Those are a few specific ways in which you can teach um, SEL in the classroom. But like Molly said, it's all about creating the right uh, environment for opportunities, teaching, modeling, monitoring, and then repeat. Because when it comes to, to programs, it's always important for us to say, you're never done. You can always learn, you can always improve, you should always want to improve. So there is no end to teaching SEL or creating the right environment for SEL. And that's why, in fact, it is the plate, not one more thing on the plate, it's the actual plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tito, what you said is so important. I think, you know, we talk, Goldie loves the term mental fitness. And that's really what we're talking about here. You know, we know our physical health is important. You can't go to the gym once and say one and done, I'm good. <laughs> it's really something that you need to work on regularly and consistently. And the same is true for social emotional learning and well-being and mental health. It's, it's something that needs to be addressed on a daily basis. And so MindUp provides a framework for teachers to begin to do that, do that in the classroom. And, and one sort of other point I really want to highlight again and again, and Dito mentioned it with creating that context of care and inclusion and belonging. We can't begin to talk about um, social and emotional development and learning and mental health in classrooms when students don't feel connected and included. So that's why we really put that in the forefront of the lesson one is building community because that is a, a critical ingredient for, for all learning. We know that kids who feel um, that they're not connected and they don't belong, they're less, they're less engaged, they're less um, motivated and connected to their school. So that, that's a really critical piece. And of course, the adult is the one who is um, sort of the, um, the captain of the ship, right? So they need to sort of be steering it in that, in that direction towards inclusion. Well, that was a very thorough definition for both of you. Thank you. I mean, it's <laughs> great to think about. <laughs> I love it. And it's, and, it's, and it's really super important to see how layered nuance, it's not just one thing. And I, I love that. So what are some of the key skills that every school should emphasize in a social and emotional learning curriculum or program such as MindUp? Yeah, that's a <clears throat> that's a good question. And I think, you know, we've we've kind of touched on a bit of this. And I would say, you know, certainly before embarking on any kind of social and emotional learning program, you want to focus on that, uh, the context, that that safe and caring environment. Um, we know that that's vital. You also want to focus on your teachers 
making sure that your your educators are feeling socially and emotionally competent themselves to teach something like this. So what we've learned in the research, you know, not just mind up, but is the field in general, social emotional learning, when teachers aren't confident or have um, not the greatest social emotional skills themselves, they can actually um, do harm when implementing this type of program. I mean, you can imagine if you go to like, you know, I use this example because it's kind of funny, but you go to a yoga class and you're expecting, you know, I'm going to feel great after this yoga class. And the, your, your yoga teacher comes in totally stressed out and a little bit angry. <laughs> you can imagine how that's going to go. So, you know, right. put that in the classroom where you have a, a teacher who's going to talk about feelings and emotions and stress who is not modeling effective stress management it can be problematic. So that's why we really, you know, with, with our new approach in our second edition, we've focused on that contextual piece around creating the safety and, and, and caring and belonging. And also we've, we've been working on uh, developing research resources to, to support educator well-being, understanding that the educator is actually at the heart of it, at the front of of this sort of, of movement of implementing social emotional learning. Um, there's a great theoretical model for those of you who are, you know, nerdy like me, uh, like that like frameworks um, by Tish Jennings and Mark Greenberg. It came out in 2009 and it's called the pro-social classroom. So if you Google pro-social classroom to any of the listeners, you'll see a little framework come up. And it, it shows how the educator is actually at the beginning of everything, that, they, that they're the first input and their social emotional competence then leads to effective SEL implementation, which then leads to those more, you know, further away outcomes for students, which is around their well-being, their academic success and their social emotional development. And the other thing I'll just I'll say, I'll, I'll just want to mention uh, to sure, be sure I get it in there uh, at some point today, is that we know that social emotional development and learning is connected to academic learning. So that when kids have higher levels of social emotional skills, they actually do better in school. So there's been research that shows social emotional uh, programming. When kids have exposure to that over a couple of years, they actually do better, not just in their social emotional skills, but also in their academics. Makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Dito, anything else to add to yeah, that? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, 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 the first thing I would say is that I always want school leaders and educators to think about this idea of a way of life. That means that when I walk through a school to do a visit, it is not because I'm seeing somebody teach a, an SEL curriculum or mind up that I know that this school is successful at implementing SEL. It is in the way in which people interact with each other. It is in the, 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 the comfort with which the kids feel, uh, raise their hand and contribute in the classroom. And it's the vulnerability around admitting that you don't have the answer and knowing that the environment is safe. And then when you go beyond, it is having a list of, of it's, that, it's that toolbox, having access to those tools that you can reach into the, the toolbox and use one to see if it helps you regulate your emotions. If it doesn't work, you reach into the, to the, to, to, the toolbox to get the other one. And if you can't, um, regulate your emotions, you know where to go or who to go to. So it's a, it's a full effort and it starts with the school leader, it goes through the, the, the educators. I, I always highlight to, to school leaders and teachers, if you have mind up in your classroom and you are teaching the kids about emotion regulation and mindfulness, and yet when there's what you call a misbehavior, you send them to a dean's office where they get, get a whack in the head. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't work well together. That's not a, an SEL focused school. Every adult in the school needs to have exposure and understanding of these tools. And then of course, we care about the parents. So we are constantly creating and sharing resources for parents. So one practical way in which um, I can elaborate on what Molly said about academic achievement is simply put, a brain that is happier and calmer can learn better. It, it'd be difficult to disagree with that. If your brain is unsettled and you are angry, upset, frustrated, anxious, it's very difficult for you to listen to your teacher or to read and understand. In fact, I would challenge any adult listening to keep that book that they want to read and or that problem that they need to solve and wait right as you get frustrated by anything, try to solve the problem and let me know how successful you are versus doing the opposite, which is 
do something as simple as what makes you settled and happy. That may be taking a walk by the beach. It may be sitting down with coffee and listen to the birds in the morning. Do that and then try to solve the problem. You will see for yourself that the state of your brain plays a crucial role in how you learn and, and how you show up in the world. So a specific example in a school would be if a student has a test or an exam. Right before the test, we all know how, uh, how anxious we become before a big presentation or a big interview, for example. So if a student is feeling stressed and dysregulated before an exam, how will they perform well? if they can't right. regulate those emotions or the better question would be, would you be willing to see if they would perform better if they had some tools to regulate their emotions? And the answer hopefully is yes, you would be willing to see that if you're an educator. Um, and that's why I think that every single school needs to have a well-researched uh, proven to work SEL program, at least attempt it and see the results for yourself. Agreed, 100%. And, you know, you've touched upon um, educators, you know, and adults needing that specific training to integrate a program such as MindUp. So could you tell us the importance of having adults to, tra to be trained in SEL and, and, you know, focusing on that as well? Sure. I mean, I think I think there's you can come at it from two, two places. Um, I, I think Dito spoke a little bit about that hidden curriculum um, in schools and and having the adults all sort of bought in and understanding really the the theoretical framework of mind up and SEL in, in general. So just having that understanding of like why are we doing this? Why is this important? Um, because certainly um, a lot of teacher preparation programs don't include social and emotional learning in their training. So teachers are coming in perhaps not with uh, the background that they need to have. So I would say it's, it's that level of, of professional development. It's also personal development. You know, it's, it's, it's providing teachers the same skills that we want to have for their students. You know, when we all went to school, we didn't have this. I didn't have social <laughs> emotional learning in my school. And I, you know, when I became older, I thought, well, that, gee, that would have been really helpful. Um, so I think a lot of the educators in the field today didn't have it either. So, so we're really kind of coming at this to to bring everybody up to speed, uh, to to the to you know a, a, a common knowledge um, and addressing some of that piece around the the hidden curriculum and understanding how yes discipline is connected to this and and you know you can't you can't employ punitive discipline practices when you're trying to use a strength based. Um, social emotional learning program where you're promoting empathy and perspective taking and peaceful conflict resolution. So, so it's 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 quite nuanced and complicated. You know, it's not just um, oh, just learn how to implement these f fifteen to seventeen lessons. It's it's much more, it's deeper than that. And we're learning more as the field grows as to you know how do we best um, prepare teachers to to do this. Um, but I, I think, you know, and Dito certainly has, has lots of experience working, working with educators, and I've trained educators as well. Um, a lot of the time when we're talking about mind up, the teachers actually begin to talk about themselves and applying it to the, for their own well-being. And coming back to that importance of a, a, adult well-being, uh, the importance of adult social-emotional competence, it begins from there because we need teachers to embody this. And I'll just kind of back this up with some research. And this was research, uh, not on MindUp, but another program. And it was with early childhood educators. And these educators received a program for them, a mindfulness-based program for them. And the researchers looked at this, you know, they had a con control group and everything. It was an experimental design. And they found that the teachers that got this training versus those that did not, they had improvements in their own well-being and stress management, but they also found changes in the kids. They found changes in those students that the students of the of the teachers who got this training actually improved behaviorally. So that indicates that there's something about addressing the teacher's needs 
and it having a trickle down for, for students. So that's kind of one of the rationale. And then the second rationale is that sort of instructional piece. Like, well, how do you do this? How do you actually implement the lessons? How do you do a mindful practice and lead a brain break? And all of those pieces are important. And then the third piece, I'm adding another one, is how do you then take this Mind Up, Mind Up program, which is a framework, a springboard, I'd say, a springboard for more mindful teaching, which is then, you know, how do you weave it into everything that you're doing? Um, because the other piece that, that we know is important is, you know, social emotional learning isn't something you do on Tuesdays from 10 to 1030. I know a lot of schools like to just compare, you know, this is, we do math there and that, that, but how do you weave it into everything that you're doing so that it's permeating through? And I think, you know, when we talk about, there's lots of buzzwords, you know, 21st century learning, soft skills, non-cognitive skills, social emotional skills, emotional intelligence, we're kind of all talking about similar things. Those things can be practiced in any kind of uh, academic learning environment. And so I'm gonna, I've been talking a lot, so I'm gonna stop now and, and <laughs> pass it to Dito to kind of expand on, on some of those ideas. I would, add, I would add a couple of things. The first one is a very real element of, if you are a teacher and you are given any program without being explained or brought into why it makes sense, why would you implement it when you have one of the most stressful jobs in the world? That's a very real, Let's just be honest about it. Teachers are going through a lot right now. The last thing they need is a new program, curriculum, or initiative that's not, ex that's not thoughtfully uh, rolled out. So that thoughtfulness is why we begin with, let us explain to you what this is and why it makes sense for you. So, right, so from understanding, so from being thoughtful about uh, adding one more thing to then explaining why it makes sense to them because the first people who are affected by the disruption with, say, COVID, for example, it's the teachers because while many industries were able to close and struggle, we couldn't just close schools. In fact, I, I credit education with the innovation of, 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 of Zoom being so, so popular because other jobs, restaurants closed. You couldn't go to the movie theater, like it, or many, many uh, places of business closed, but you couldn't stop educating. So who was charged with figuring that out? It's teachers who are staffed with figuring out how to teach virtually, how to teach in person some days, how to have a hybrid model where somehow you have some kids in front of you, but some at home, and some of the ones who are at home you can't even see because the computer is off. So teachers were the ones, so they are the first people who need to develop those competencies as well. And then I'm connecting to what Molly said about then how do you teach it? Right. So once you got the, the buy in, you will see how you can take care for yourself. How do you teach these skills? Because we some people people often believe that um, you are born with empathy or with emotion regulation. And look, you may be born with a certain level of it, but you could certainly improve. You could certainly be, be become better at it. So there are specific ways to teach. And then the final point is I am going to keep talking about this way of life. It is not about teach the program on this day. I'd be the first one to say, Mind Up has an initiative called Mind Up Monday. Let me say it out there for everybody who follows our Mind Up Monday. Mind Up Monday doesn't mean that the only time you practice Mind Up uh, skill set, skills is on Mondays. All it means is that we're gonna give you a reminder on Mondays, but we want you to practice this every day of your life. Same thing for the class, the, the, the schools that have say an advisory or any other dedicated class period to teach mind up or anything SEL related. It's a place to remind students of the importance of, of SEL or mind up, teach them those skills, practice them, answer the questions. However, it doesn't stop there. It's every single day. And the more adults can internalize this, 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 this understanding of SEL, the more adept they become at identifying ways in which they can use those skills everywhere all the time in every lesson you will ever teach any interaction you will ever have if you are trained there's a way in which you can use these skills to help it go better even with a conversation with the parents like like this when you become uh, a, a, a fluent in in sel practices you're able to leverage them in your entire life personal and professional. That's been my experience and many educators who've shared the same thing with me. I like that. Having fluency in a, 
in like a, another language, isn't it? It's yeah, it's really, really well said, and um, you really see the importance of the trickle down effect of starting with adult and as you were saying also Molly, and then when it goes into you know the classroom and the kids and into the family and and uh, the importance of that. So um, bravo, bravo with all the training and the, what you've been doing because it's it's making differences for sure. And you've also got the science to back it up. So in the international middle years curriculum, or what we call the IMYC, we are turning to experts like yourselves to help look at some of the learning goals we devised for the health and well-being. So in the strand of growing and changing, we emphasize the importance of being able to implement strategies aimed at reducing stress and improving well-being. And we also would like students and teachers to know how the developments in the teenage brain can impact risky decisions and making. So with MindUp, you have accomplished some excellent work in regard to these areas. So I'll start with you, Molly, and then I'll also ask the other question to Dido. Molly, with your research and expertise, which strategies have you found to be some of the most effective ways to reduce stress? So I'm going to begin by by talking about, you know, rather than thinking about, you know, how to reduce things that we don't want to see, you know, reduce antisocial behavior, reducing stress, although that's important, what we can do and one of the most effective things we can do is to promote uh, positive mental health. So do the things that we know are actually strengths-based. So one of those uh, strategies would be practicing gratitude. So there's been a lot of research over the past 20 years looking at this um, in, in both kids and adults and finding that that's a really powerful way to promote uh, more well-being. Um, there's interesting studies that looked at, you know, if you focus on gratitude or you focus on your daily hassles, what happens? I mean, not a big shocker. Kids who focus on daily hassles, actually, we're not doing as well as kids who focus on gratitude. So these are things that we can implement. And it's really a part of um, brain training. So we have a brain that is actually wired to have a bit of a negativity bias. Um, and that was, you know, from evolutionary psychology, that was a, a protective thing. But in modern times, our, our stressors and challenges are different. So we actually need to train our brain to be more optimistic and more positive. And so that's one of the key uh, pieces of mind up. So that's one thing. Other other areas, certainly for, for promote, reducing stress, is just holistic lifestyle things. You know, you, you can, you need to exercise, you need to get outside, spend time in nature. Uh, one of the well, the biggest predictor of longevity has been discovered to be relationships. So we keep coming back to relationships, you know, mind up a focus on building community, um, connect with others. This, the, the effects of the pandemic, I think a lot of those ill effects are from we have had to be apart. And that was really hard. And for our students, extremely challenging at a time when they, um, especially those early adolescents and adolescents, want to be together and we told them they had to be apart that was very challenging so recognizing that and finding ways to connect whenever whenever you can um the other the other area that's um gotten a lot of uh, attention recently has been uh, breath work so actually regulating your, your breathing in a way that promote puts you into that uh, rest and digest system which calms the body um, so a lot of this has to do with the physiological of regulating your nervous system and you can do that through breath you can do that uh, through uh, exercise um, and healthy eating of course and then the other are the cognitive strategies so things around gratitude positive self-talk reframing strategies around um, you know uh, becoming more optimistic um, all of those things can help but at the at the center of that is is relationships That's great strategies, and there are a lot of them there to focus on. Dito, I'm going to ask you about the other question. Why should students know about how their brain develops? Why should teachers and parents know some of the neuroscience? Because at well? the end of the day, nobody wants to be tricked into anything. Like It's this concept of, I'm going to trick my students into being mindful. It's like, why would you do that? Just teach them how to like, open the hood and show them what's happening inside. And how empowering is it to, to, to understand why is it that the text message that I received from my friend or from my cousin made me feel so angry right away and I really wanted to do something violent? If you understand, like Molly said, that this is coming from a part of your brain that evolved to protect you when there was actual life-threatening danger, but you can tell that that part of the brain doesn't always know the difference between a real 
in the perceived danger, then you know, oh, it's the text message now is essentially replacing the saber tooth tiger, except I know this text message can't eat me. There's nothing more empowering than, than that kind of knowledge. So once you have that, not only do you perform better in the class, but the punchline is everywhere else you go. As a student, you don't need to have your teacher around you anymore to remind you how to use these tools. You don't need to have your parent. You do it yourself. And that's what the goal is. The goal is not for... When, so when I was a teacher, I always said that the, the best compliment I can have uh, from my students or a teacher who covered my class when I was away was if I left and there was nobody watching the students and yet they were doing what they were supposed to do in a sense of using the tools, the strategies. That's what the goal is. That's how you build a lifestyle. So for me, it's important for students to understand how their brain works, understand how to use these strategies to, to, to live a more fulfilled life because nobody's going to always be there with them. You are going to face a stressful situation where you, you can't call your parents. You can't call your buddy. You have to react right now. And then also having knowledge makes us be less, less judgmental because we, because our brains have a negativity bias, Molly talked about positive self-talk. And that's important because in negative self-talk, it's a big thing. Most people, if you just ask somebody to journal every single day, how often they catch themselves talking to themselves negatively, try it for yourself and you will see it happens a lot more than you think. And so when you realize that the negative self-talk comes from the way your brain evolved, first you say, okay, my brain is normal, right? I'm not abnormal. I'm not weird. I just have a brain that has a negativity bias. And then that knowledge is even more empowering because now you know you can do something about it. The, the practice that Molly talked about Training yourself to scan the world for the positive intentionally. Practicing perspective taking intentionally and shifting from always seeing what's not working and what you don't have into more of what is working and what you do have is slowly rewiring your brain to actually change. So it's always better to open the hood and show folks what's happening inside and give them the tools to go do it for themselves and for the people around them instead of just hoping that we can trick them into understanding something so amazing as social emotional learning, emotion regulation and whatnot. So teach them what's happening so they can understand for themselves and teach others as well. And know yeah. the basics, the mechanics, you know, mm -hmm. that be your own mechanic in a way. I just want to add one. Well said. Thing. I can't well, help myself. Just around the, oh, the go ahead. piece. And specifically, because I know you're, you yeah. were talking about your middle years curriculum, Lee, and just, you know, that right. time of life and how powerful it is to demystify some of that for adolescents so that they understand and learn all of the amazing wonderful changes that are happening in their brain um, but that, that also brings challenges so just as Dita was saying like let's open the hood look under the hood what's happening to demystify it and it helps to normalize this for this stage of development for adolescents at a time when they often feel like I'm the only one in the world that is feeling this way. Um, when they learn more about their brain, they recognize that actually, no, this is normal and I'm not weird. And this is mm -hmm. part of it. And there are strategies to help me um, have a more positive experience. Fantastic. And um, where MindUp can come in to help with those strategies. You've given such great um, insight, analogies. Uh, it's been just so great to look under your hood, like what goes in your brain and what you go through um, working through Mind Up. So I'd like to end on a takeaway. And so I'd like to ask you, start with you, Molly, what is one takeaway you would like the listeners and viewers out there to know about either SEL, mindfulness, or any of um, your work? I guess, experience? well, I guess the key takeaway for, you know, the broader umbrella of mental health promotion. Uh, fueled by SEL and mindfulness and positive psychology and neuroscience, is that it's for everybody. So it's 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 for it's for uh, you know from age zero to ninety nine, and it's something that we need to prioritize throughout our whole life. The, the takeaway for me is takeaway? I just want everybody who's listening to know that you you matter and you deserve to live a more fulfilled life. 
Because when you think about the negative self-talk and the negativity bias, we often can easily get into a point where we feel as if it's okay to not be, to not feel better. It's like the famous example of somebody going to the doctor because they have back pain. And the doctor asks, what's the level of pain that you feel? And I said, normal level of pain. What's a normal level of pain? You should have no pain in your back. So you deserve to have a life where there's less stress. Don't give in to this idea that being busy is good. Not sleeping enough is amazing. You're bragging about your full calendar. Don't give in to that. You deserve to have a, a job, a career, a life that involves lots of time caring for yourself, lots of time caring for your well-being, and just feeling good. So if you can take any of those tools that we, 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 we offer in this conversation or with MindUp, to make your life a little bit better, a little less stressful, do that because you deserve it. Amen. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank you so much, um, Molly and Dido, for your time today and for all your insights. And uh, I'd like to also just say to those who are listening or to our viewers, for more resources and information about how your school can become an official MindUp member, complete online training, and deliver the program, please check out the official website at mindup.org. Thank you again, and we really appreciate your time. Thanks, Lee. Thank you.